Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about scalable CSS. So let's get into it. So the question in question came from a student who reached out to me with a ton of questions related to scalable CSS. So let's go through it. Hi Frederick, I am a student who is writing an essay on scalable CSS and let's see here I would appreciate it if you could answer a few of my questions uh, alright here are a bunch of questions so first question is at your place of work what team are you working in so at my current job I work as the tech lead for an internal system a, an internal platform system that is being built or rather the history is sort of like there the company had uh, an ambition to sort of uh, uh, combine and well uh, to to combine all they, they have a very large amount of system this is a very very big company uh, and they had a lot of sharding in the ecosystem and a lot of different systems that handled parts of their internal processes for orders and for like sales and metrics and quotes and so forth and so forth and so forth and so what they wanted was basically to create some system that could show that all of the because they were sort of going through a transformation creating a lot of APIs to fetch information from these different systems and they wanted to create a proof of concept that proved that you could get some value from connecting to all of these APIs and so they hired a consultant and like a few like specific middle managers took interest in this and so they created this proof of concept where they sort of displayed information from different systems in a way that some of the internal people working in the support areas of the company found, found to be very useful and so they decided that alright we want to take this to the next level we want to create like an internal platform think sort of like yeah, like a uh, a one system to rule them all type of deal, right? And that's when they come and I, where the, the, I joined the, uh, the company uh, about that time if in another team and so I uh, know one of the managers that I work with, he's my old mentor and he's been well, semi following my career, which has been really nice. He's taught me a lot, and he asked basically, Well, Frederick, we have this thing like this sort of startup issue or like a small proof of concept hackathon project, and we needed to, like, could you take it as a team lead and then, like, make it into like this gigantic platform thing? And I say yes, and so I start and I build the, I start as the first developer, and then we basically build up a team. And like I establish all the processes and like so forth and so forth and after a while we are, we have basically that platform and as you the then they sort of ask me what what should we do like what is the vision and I say well I, my vision for this is very simple I think we should build something very similar to a cloud provider platform where you create a system which is just a bunch of kernels where you have different modules different products that f live in like different spaces and then you have like a navigation menu um, as you have in Amazon, AWS, or GCP, Azure, etc., etc., where different teams they, they can, because they have all these projects, right? And so we're going to start. Mo we we started moving them to this unified monorepo that we were creating. So all these systems could sort of start living closer together, and we could start creating some good standards and create a more consistent experience for all of our stakeholders. People seem to be very up on board with that, and so that's what I do. I lead that team and do all the plan most of the planning and a lot of the coding as well how many front-end developers are you we are four three or four I think in my team in the company at large it's like hundreds and hundreds uh, of uh, front-end developers uh, I interview most of them uh, almost all of them I think well not all of them but more than 80 like, let's say around 80 50, at least 50 up to 80 percent of them uh, I do the interviews and like, evaluate and so forth what CSS strategy are you using so we are using a CSS in JS solution called Fela uh, I think I pronounced that right which is an open source library uh, and uh, yeah that's that's pretty much that uh, what is the f biggest 
benefit with our with your CSS strategy. So the biggest benefit is that we have, since we're using React on the front end as well, it sort of and CSS and JS is sort of it almost becomes a byword like. Um, or that they are, they're very tightly coupled, so the biggest benefit is usually that the, we can hire people who feel very comfortable with the tool. So they mean this is a small, a small time library in comparison to the bigger solutions that are more well maintained, but the principles behind it is fairly are pretty straightforward. And from the inter like the APIs and interfaces for consuming the CSS and JS solutions are almost identical. So it's not really it's not alien to anybody. It's very simple to, for people to use. I would say that that is the biggest benefit to it. What is the biggest um, consequence of the strategy? It's a poorly supported library with only one maintainer. Uh, we, I think, we actually hired uh, him to help us uh, work within the company on this thing and sort of maintain it in a good way. Uh, but that is definitely a risk. It's not like one of the mainstream libraries and it's one of those things where if it doesn't get support it might be a problem in the future. It's always difficult to bet on uh, front-end technology because things are changing all the time and that makes things very difficult. For on a scale from 1 to 10, how scalable is your strategy? Well, that's practically impossible to say. I think because uh, scalability can mean so many things. If you think about long term, it's basically a zero because this is there's no way that this is going to be a good. So uh, or it's very unlikely that this, this specific solution is going to be a good solution in ten years, twenty years, thirty years. I mean, the company that I work for is older than most most people. It's a, a pretty old company. Uh, but uh, in terms of like here and now, the scalability is pretty good. All the teams are using the same solution. Everybody sort of understands how it works. We don't really have any problems with CSS or anything like that. And it's performant enough for us. It fills our needs and so forth. But it is a risk. And the architects, the head architect and myself, we are buddies. So and we've talked. He he has told me the same thing. Where uh, I used to, well, I used to work in his team, and so I highlighted. I think that this is a risk, and he agrees that we might want to move to something more mainstream because or decouple it and not actually use a CSS in JS solution or maybe like try to go more towards the standards because he as myself are big believers in that uh, there, there are tr temporary like transition technologies and then there are things that stay for years and years and years uh, like the standards and so forth and those are usually the good bets. On a scale from 1 to 10 how much do you agree with the, with the following statement? It is necessary to use a preprocessor or a CSS in JS solution if you want to ex develop scalable CSS. Well, I don't. There is not a CSS in JS is, in my opinion, like a completely like it, there's nothing about it that makes things more scalable. It is a tool to make things scalable. A preprocessor, I would say, is pretty much a necessity unless you're working on like a really small project. And the reason why I need to argue that is because it's not really a good practice to import all your different CSS style sheets, for example. It sort of make it, makes it hard to scale CSS if you're forced to all work in one super file. So uh, the way that I usually do things in my own personal projects is to just use post-CSS or something similar where I can do like imports, the bare minimum, and then everything else is like just complete vanilla CSS so I can compile it into one big file. Uh, I don't even use SCSS anymore because I don't see a point in doing it anymore. Uh, there is really no reason for it, and then I use BAM for like naming conventions and so forth. But that really comes back to like the whole problem of scalability. Scalability is very easy if you have someone who really knows their th their stuff, and like that is not usually the case in bigger companies or in any company where you have some people who are sort of starting out juniors and you have people who are seniors and then you have seniors who don't know what they're doing uh, there's uh, it's a range of things so I would say that the this is a 10 for sure you need some type of preprocessor in order to do this in a sustainable way but there are many ifs and buts uh, on everything else on a scale from 1 to 10, how much do you agree with the following statement? The problem with CSS is not CSS, the problem is the, develop or is the developers. 
well I would say again seven because once again I mean if you really know what you're doing and you <coughs> and you have the experience to work with CSS well it's it's the tri most trivial thing in the world scalability in CSS is usually just a problem if you don't know how to scale CSS and if you have a senior software developer or someone who knows that and they set up the right structure around everything it doesn't really make you mean most developers don't actually know all the, you know, they were actually really shit at CSS actually uh, but the, the problem it's sort of it's hard to define because the tooling around CSS and like uh, you know having problems with duplication in CSS and cascation and all this stuff this uh, CSS is poorly designed in my opinion if we th if we think about scalability it's really well designed for small scale stuff that not like large scale of development because there's too many it's uh, it's sort of like they give you so much rope that you're gonna be able to, that you're gonna sh hang yourself with it. It's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot if that makes sense, and it's hard to say whose fault that is. Is it's like it's like is the consumer of the things responsible for not understanding the complexities of the tool, or is the tool poorly designed? It's sort of like for me, it's the Scala discussion or the C discussion or something like that. You can always argue that if you just know what you're doing, then everything is easy. Yeah, but at the same time, you sort of have to compare that to how much investment do you need in order to actually know this thing or how to learn it and how often do even the good people make mistakes and that's pretty often even for CSS uh, what do you think are the most important rules to follow to make a robust, a robust and scalable CSS architecture so you need to establish a naming convention rule like basically either you use CSS modules uh, or you use CSS in JS or you can use BEM or some there are many ways of doing it but you have to have someone who goes in and basically says this is our architecture this is how we scale things and then that should ideally not heavily rely on cascation or inheritance or anything like complicated like that just treat it as a very simple flat structure because when you understand that the benefit of having preprocessors and like all of this stuff is that the like because CSS all it really is is a declaration of a rule and just as with PHP or anything like that, that can all live in the global context. The problem is just the collision. And the dangerous part is when you start using specificity too freely. The looser the specificity, the better. It's better for you, and that's why I love BEM, because it's better for you to just use a class for everything as a default for everything because the the odds of you getting into a situation where you design CSS in such a way that it's almost impossible to continue working on a segment of a web page without rewriting your rules is so it's sort of it's sort of low if you have classes it's sort of almost guaranteed to happen if you try to use IDs and like you know, sub selectors and like you're actually trying to make something more complicated because the mo the specificity is the thing that gets you every single time and that usually comes from the casca usage of too much casca cascation and so it's things like that and so that's the only real rule you have to follow you have to have someone who knows how to set up a good CSS architecture strategy and most people just default to CSS and JS if they're doing SBA sort of things right because that is the thing that it's you sort of get it for free just that CSS uh, modules sort of gives you the same thing for free but there are many ways to say, think about this and then you uh, the other part is that you need a way to validate that everybody's following that standard which is a whole different thing because people who are not doing the thing you tell them to do that yeah nothing can save you there and then lastly, any other feedback that you would like to provide? Yes, I would say that the problem of CSS is that most, it's sort of the entire problem of front-end. Most front-end developers are actually shit uh, engineers. They really are. Like I've interviewed hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. And the problem with front-end engineers is usually that they're actually, they, they know about the tools but they don't actually know, they have no experience whatsoever with when do you use one tool or the other. So you have people who are like, I mean, you talk about CSS and yes, and I go, okay, what if you don't have a JavaScript solution? 
what if you're just using HTML? Why, what, if, what if you're doing like, is, like, why would you use CSS and JS instead of say something like just adding things to the style element? Under what circumstances are you going to uh, do things? Most of the people I ask in, term, in interviews and so forth about when do you use say regular CSS, the style element, CSS and JS, CSS modules, post CSS, like all these different options that you have, when do you pick one over the other? Most don't know because the only reason they know how to do anything in CSS is because it was part of their bootcamp. And if you learn React, the only thing you usually know is emotion or style components, for some reason. Well, I well I don't I know the reason. It's just that m people like me who has been working on multiple types of project, we, we sort of know that you know it's sort of common that if you come from one path, you only know SCSS and another path is only CSS and JS, but the reality is that there's actually a lot of nuances to when one is better than the other. And often the decisions made in like how to scale your CSS is really has nothing more to do, it's nothing more complicated than the people who are working, they don't know any better because they don't take the time to understand the different ways that you can structure a CSS strategy. And that comes back to education. Have a great day.